Cheers indeed. Yeah, that tastes the same. It does. Yeah. Not a bad thing. No. Just it... no mezcal. I'm surprised. You know what we could have done? And I just thought of it now. What? I got for Christmas, uh, my sister got me a cocktail smoker. Oh, that's cool. And mezcal is smoky. Right. That's like, that's its defining characteristic. We could have smoked these, uh, but that's like a 20 minute procedure. Yeah. And I don't. It's fine. Next time. Next time. Next time. <laughs> um, what is your favorite horror movie? Sure. We didn't get to yours. Uh, well, the original Halloween, but it, it's also, I, I used to feel like embarrassed to say that because it's so cliche, but it's cliche for a reason. Like, it's a fucking good movie, you know? Yes. Um, the Haunting from 1963, not, not the, the Catherine Zeta Jones version. Right, right, right. Which is fun on a right. Like, yeah. that's like, it's one of my sick day movies where it's just, it's bad. Man. I it's, saw it very young. And so one of my core memories, uh, of like cinema is Owen Wilson getting his head lopped off in the Thank fireplace. God, I can't stand him. It's the best part of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Wait, you can't stand Owen Wilson in that movie or just in general? In general. Oh, oh no. I know. Oh, he's... I know he's beloved. People really love him. Oh, he's so good lately too. I, I, I Loki did not speak to me. The TV show. Yeah. But I understand why and that it's a big hit. I think that is his best performance because he's not Owen Wilson in it. Like he was just in the Haunted Mansion movie and I love that. I really liked it. Yeah. But he's but just he was, Owen oh. Wilson dressed as a priest. You know, uh, yeah. every movie is him, Owen Wilson, dressed as whatever he's supposed to be playing. Yeah. In my opinion. My my casting buddy has that opinion on a couple different people. Uh he just doesn't think are good actors and yeah. I disagree with him as well. Okay. Um, my buddy doesn't think Christian Bale is a good actor. Oh, that's a bold statement. It's a bold statement. He says that he thinks he gets the same performance out of him no matter what. Strong disagree. Strong disagree. Yeah. You know who I think though, and this is you're gonna probably strong disagree with this as well. But lately, like the last six, seven movies he's done. I've kind of gotten that vibe from this actor, kind of the same thing every time. And I'm kind of bored of it to the point where when they announce him in a movie, I'm like, meh. Who is it? Leonardo DiCaprio. Okay. I I am uninterested yeah. in anything in his future because I feel like I've seen everything that he's got to offer. I have not seen many of his recent films. I I didn't, was it The Revenant? Was that the one that he won the Oscar for? Yes. Did not see it. Uh, I, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood did not work for me personally. Same. I'm I struggle with Quentin Tarantino now. I used to worship him. And then I just kind of, once I caught on to his shtick, was less enthused. But that, uh, that movie didn't do it for me. And I, he gives a good performance. There's nothing wrong with his performance, but it wasn't it. Here's my thing. The Quentin Tarantino movies where he's doing this revisionist history, like Inglorious bastards where Hitler dies in a movie theater fire. I, it doesn't, I don't understand why. And so at the end of once upon a time in Hollywood, when Sharon Tate is not murdered, I don't understand why. Okay. That's fair. Her family said it was really lovely for them to get to imagine a universe where she didn't get killed. And I think that that's really cool. But it, it, I'm just, I don't understand taking the Manson family and like... Having them lose? Changing the out... I, it just doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand this revisionist history of of like like it's a fun idea why go as far as to make a full budget movie with leo dicaprio and brad pitt and well, especially if that's a secondary plot point you know yeah i feel like i feel like the way quentin tarantino does it he has three or four full plots except for django django was a pretty 
standard movie, actually. Mm. That might of... be Leonardo DiCaprio's best performance, in my opinion. He's so fucking evil. What do you think? I'm thinking. He's also very good in What's Eating Covert Grape. So, okay. So, and I, and I did say this. Three cameras that can verify. Maybe not that one. It can't see me. But I said lately, like last yes, seven, eight that's movies. Right. What has he done recently? I mean, everything that he's, like, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was not for me. My buddy swears by it. Yeah, it's got this. It's I've got had guys mansplain hole. it to me. Like, yeah. no, you don't understand. It's like a callback to this time in Hollywood. And I'm like, no, I know. Yeah. Like, I get it. I, yeah. I get the movie. We weren't there for that, though. It's like calling back to it. Hey, do you remember when Hollywood looked like this? No, right. I wasn't alive. But, you know, and it also, I'm not saying it's a bad movie. It's right. not for me. Like I said earlier, right? Like, right. it's just not for me. <sighs> what else? I guess I guess I don't know my Leo list yeah. as well as I thought I did, but... I'm not interested in Killers of the Flower Moon. Oh, not even a little bit. Not even bit. a little bit. Um, the Revenant wasn't for me. So, I mean, Inception, I enjoyed. I haven't seen it. Inception's a lot of fun. I know, yeah. But not, like, Leo doesn't give a powerhouse performance by any means. Yeah. Um, Gatsby, Shutter Island... Wolf of Wall Street. I haven't, it's it's all the same. I haven't seen Wolf me. of Wall Street. Wolf of Wall Street is good. Yeah. It's it's good. Yeah. It's fun. It's not a film that appeals to me. It's just not my kind of movie. I should probably see that one at least maybe. If they were going to give him an Oscar for something, it should have probably been Wolf of Wall Street, not mm -hmm. The Revenant. Yeah. But as you know, and this is why I'm not going to ever be nominated in the future. They're going to mm -hmm. come back to this episode. The Oscars are mostly political, not performance or talent based. I have no interest in award shows anymore. I grew up loving them, but I loved them because Joan Rivers was mean on the red carpet. Like, let's be honest. <laughs> it's the same filmmakers jerking each other off. Yeah. Year after year. And it's like, especially now that you know, I go to film festivals and I get to see independent films that don't get exposure. Like those are a lot of the better films that I saw last year. So I don't know if you know that I have a film currently doing the festival circuit. No, tell me everything. Um, I will tell you everything, but I want to tell you something frustrating first, as we submit to everything, as we submit to all of these festivals, we found out that, you know, for the, bigger ones, Tribeca, Cannes, Sundance, that most and like 90% when I say most of the slots are already taken by sponsors. Oh yeah. So that checks out. Sundance selection is not as prestigious as you might think yeah. because that slot was bought. It wasn't earned. It wasn't right. a, like Adam Sandler's performance in whatever was not in a movie that earned that slot. No. It's in a movie that bought that slot. Of course. Um, yeah, that's not surprising. Yeah, unfortunately. But I made a movie. Yeah. Or I helped my buddy make a movie. Um, I was just one of the producers, but we made a movie with a roughly half a million dollar budget. Oh, my God. Um, we are now trying to figure out how to get that money back but we're doing the festival circuit we made our premiere at uh dances with films oh i saw a movie at dances with films what did you see um shit i can't remember the name of it what was it about <laughs> it had to do with medieval mm -mm. lore nope not mine <laughs> Okay. Im immediately not mine great um, Wait, were you at dances with films la or dances with films new york new york okay yeah, yeah. um so it's it's about a young girl who whose father passed away and this man steps in as a father figure and is to make money dealing with bad people, dealing mm. with drugs and guns. And she is living in this bad house and she escapes to, this is in Jersey, she escapes to New York City. Wow. And encounters low life people that she likes parties with and they're like a bad influence and then she encounters good people she gets a job at a coffee shop and a job at a bar and you've got like these 
pillars of society people like the guy running the coffee shop is a vet and he's like disciplined and he's like i'm gonna take a chance on you type thing and then this woman running the bar same thing like trying to impart wisdom and i'm not gonna give away anything more than that because it's a good movie yeah um but we were at dances with films we sold out the saturday night 8 p.m slot wow very quickly that's huge to the point where we were the only movie that got a second slot. That's fucking cool. Yeah. So we had a Thursday at 3 p.m. and a Saturday at 8 p.m. viewing. And I believe the the Saturday was sold out. I believe the Thursday was less than 10 seats shy of being sold out as well. Congratulations. Thank you. That's incredible. Yeah. That's I'm, really cool. I'm excited about it. My buddy Isaac wrote, directed, and produced it. I produced it. I jumped in. It was a COVID um, project. Yeah. You know, I posted, we didn't know each other back then, but if we did, you would have been seeing like, hey, like spread information and uh, donate to this GoFundMe for this movie that I'm helping my friend produce. And then I bumped up to a higher level producer when I brought in big money by means of finding investors that donated like five, six figure type amounts as opposed to like my family that gave 50 bucks or a hundred bucks. That's incredible. Yeah. So what you're saying is when I finish my screenplay and it's time to shoot, you're going to produce my film. I'm not saying no. <laughs> Great. What is the, can you give me any kind of brief synopsis on this screenplay that you're writing? Is this an elevator pitch? This should be real alcohol. I'd be more inclined to say yes. Uh, it is a horror film. Surprise, surprise. So there is a, a a big surge right now of queer horror filmmakers like starting to really show up and telling their own queer stories and making these films themselves, right? Um, I'm friends with the guys with Monster Makeup Productions. They made a film called Death Drop Gorgeous that did uh, pretty well on this. You know, it's on Shutter and yeah. their new film, St. Drogo, is stunning and it's i've never seen nuances of gay relationships showcased like this in this film nice it's kind of a modern folk horror and so just really inspired by them and they write and direct and and act in their own movies and so uh, i'm writing a screenplay it is a queer punk horror musical reflective of my own experience with substances so and um and drug and alcohol and you know, it's kind of a a grief trauma horror movie, which then lends itself to the elevated horror bullshit. But these grief trauma horror movies are happening left and right for a reason. And it's because our generation saw 9-11 and now we just got out of COVID and we have yeah. a lot of shit to process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that queer punk horror musical is very specific and, you know, selling that to an audience, I, I know that it exists because it's something that I would see, you know? And so, and I do, I do intend to be in it myself and play that character. Nice. Yeah. This is going to be steering more like the hereditary, like elevated serious horror or a little bit more camp. It's so or... it's not, it's not camp. It is, it is, um, it is committed to, the fact that it is a movie musical that doesn't have to be funny to be a musical. Okay. That's dealing with serious subject matter and musicals that deal with serious subject matter exist. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And so I think that's what, you know, and my reasons for making it a musical in my opinion are justified within the story. Uh, and so it's been exciting and interesting. I've never written a screenplay before. And so seeing a story, Seeing an idea become a story has been really cool for me. Um, the moment when I realized, okay, like this is not just an idea for a movie. This is this is a movie mm -hmm. was a really cool, impactful moment, you know. Uh, and so, uh, currently seeking a composer to <laughs> that was going to be my question. I had and, yeah. you know I had a really exciting composer to work with. He's in a metal band, and uh, and he is he's taken on too many projects, and so. If I finish this one, it, it's gonna. It, I I'm, I'm looking for a composer. Got it. Right now, 
preferably someone who you know is familiar with kind of goth industrial sad like like trent reznor if i could just finish a treatment and get it in trent reznor's hands i'm okay. sure he would be happy to write the music for this film i will tag him for thanks. every short clip that i pull from this and post great I will tag him. thanks trent can't wait to work with you that's exciting yes it is is the idea of because i'm not musically inclined mm-hmm I can do karaoke pretty well, but that's about it. Yeah. Is the idea of doing a movie, uh, the idea of doing a movie is daunting. Is the idea of doing a musical movie more, or is it just a movie, a movie is a movie, and yeah. that's going to be a lot of stress and headache already? Like It adds a certain level of financing, because <laughs> you, you have to record mm-hmm. the, so- the music, right? Uh, you know, maybe to crowdfund, you have to put on a concert with the music like kind of like a stage reading Mm -hmm. a little bit right uh you have to pay musicians you have to so there's that whole element filming i have performed in many 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 musicals on stage singing and performing on screen um i think presents a whole different set of challenges that i can't wait to explore Mm -hmm. once i get there you know um but i think I think it's a really exciting challenge. And I, you know, I, there are a couple directors that I know personally that would really, I would be really intrigued to see what they could do with this material. One mm-hmm. of them has shown interest, but nice. I have to finish a screenplay first. Right. So I, I, you know, I think, and also deeply buried internally within me is like me as a vocalist. Can I carry a movie musical? Does that make sense? Of course. It's like this insecurity that, comes from years and years of the audition process and how brutal that is you know uh the answer is yes producers i can carry a musical (laughs) um have you heard of rocky he wrote that story and then he was the lead and now it's sylvester stallone giant career yeah it's you i'm the next rocky you're gonna be the which was also turned into a musical on broadway (laughs) yeah andy carl I love Andy Carl. Yeah, he's great. He's so I, talented. I just recently went through the Groundhog Day soundtrack again. I did not expect to like that show. I love that show. I can't remember a single song from it. Like, that's not what it was about. It was a well-done story. Yeah. Great. Like, yeah. there was a Tilt-A-Whirl mm-hmm. on, that, on that stage. It was mm-hmm. so magical. I knew someone who was in it, the guy who played the mayor of Punxsutawney. Oh, he's great. Yeah. Uh, Josh Lamont. Josh. Sure. Le- he took me backstage, so he got to he showed me how some of the illusions were done. Like mm-hmm. when he would fall asleep on one side of the stage, and then you'd see him wake up and bed yeah. on the next side. It was really cool. Don't tell me. As much as I would like to know, I'd like to keep it a mystery. Yeah. Um, I was there for the opening preview. It was the opening preview was um, all gifted tickets. Okay. You entered online. I don't know if. Just not a lot of people entered. Okay. But everyone I know that did yeah. got a ticket. Okay. Like no exceptions. And so it was a very cool New York moment because we were all there watching the first preview of this show and it was going great. And then 20 minutes in, one of the platforms breaks. Fuck. And so they call hold, house lights go up, and they're like, if everyone would like to make their way to the bar, we're buying everyone one drink as an apology. And nice. so we all went and we got our drink and then we came back and we're sitting there and we're chatting. And then the director comes out and he's like, so you didn't get a chance to see that the show revolves around use of these platforms pretty heavily. Yeah, Cause it was a giant revolve yeah. on the stage well, and then the- mini revolves within that revolve. I it believe was, there were four yeah. platforms that were all inside each other and moving Incredible. in different and opposite times Incredible. and directions and speeds. and But he was basically like, we can't get one of them working tonight. So we're going to come back out here. We're going to sing the last two songs of Act 1. We're going to take another break. And then we're going to come out and we're going to do Act 2 for you as a reading. Wow. So it was very cool. Um, they just, they brought out folding chairs and then when people were in the scene or in the song, they stood up and they sang from their spot Yeah. and Andy Carl and I forget the actress that played 
uh, the female lead. I forget. Uh, is it Lily Cooper? Was it Lily Cooper? No. Are you sure? No. I thought that was like her big. Maybe. Moment. Maybe. I may be wrong. Groundhog Day opening Broadway cast. This, these are all the men that made it. <laughs> I get it, but that's not what I want. Broadway. Barrett Doss. Okay. My bad. <laughs> Lily, Lily Cooper. I'm not seeing that anywhere here. All right. I thought she was in it. Oh, well. Barrett Doss. Um, she was excellent. She was phenomenal. Yeah. Um, they would, they did a little like choreography type thing, like following each other around the chairs during one of the scenes. It was, it was very cool. Yeah. And then they invited us all back for an actual performance with the stage working. So I got to see it twice, technically. Good. That's cool. It. I'm glad. You, yeah. Yeah. It was a, it was a good show. It was the same uh, design team as Matilda, I believe. Same design team, and uh, Tim Minchin did the music to okay. the book for both. Cool. Um, he's a very weird guy, Yeah. Tim Minchin. Do you know what he looks like? Uh, no. Did you ever watch Californication? Mm-mm. I think that's really the only acting thing that he's done that I've seen him in. I know this name. But he's just like an eccentric rocker cool. kind of guy. Okay. And if you ever see him perform, there's a there's a little concert that he did where he's playing music from Groundhog Day. And it might be kind of what you were talking about where it was to raise money for the show. Mm-hmm. Um he's all in his head. He doesn't use music at all. Okay. I don't know if he knows how to read music. Yeah. But it's all in his head, and he plays piano beautifully, and he sings very well. Um, And the music he writes is really, really good. Yeah. Like, Matilda is great. Mm -hmm. Groundhog Day is great. He's done other shows, I believe. But Matilda is kind of still keeping him busy right now with the movie having just come out. Right. Um, But I'm sure he's working on something else now. Cool. Yeah. Good for him. Yeah. Very, very interesting guy. Like, I I like everything that he's done. Good. I think. You can't say that about anyone anymore. You never know. You never know. You never know, unfortunately. And now, it, now it's on camera and audio that you like this guy yeah. and he, anything can happen oh, tomorrow. God. Anything can hit the news. If he's going to get canceled, then I'm going to get canceled for liking him. Oh. And then I'm going to be like, but I said I didn't like Leo. And they're going to be like, Leo didn't do anything wrong. Well, he's controversial because he's dating, like, you turn 24 and suddenly you're no longer his girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are people, people are starting to really get upset about that, aren't they? Um, I don't, you know what? We don't need to go there. Yeah. I really don't know. I don't have an opinion on it. Yeah. And I don't mm-hmm. have to. No. That's no, the you thing. Don't. You don't have to have an opinion about everything. No. It's not my business. Yeah. He's dating someone. I don't care who anyone else is dating. Why would I care who Leo is dating? Yeah. 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 Well. If I ever meet him, though, I'll probably be like, what are you doing there? So I did. I was managing a restaurant in the Nomad area. And this very, very busy, busy, high-volume restaurant. And this guy in giant sunglasses comes up to the host stand with a beautiful woman. And he's wearing, ugh, ugh. You know those puffy coats that are shiny like a trash bag? <laughs> Wearing one of those. I fucking hate. You just look like an idiot. But he's wearing sunglasses. And I was just like, I'm so sorry. I don't have a table right now. And he leaves. And my GM came up to me like spitting mad. And he was like, did you just send Leonardo DiCaprio away? (laughs) I didn't know it was him. Right. I just didn't. He's taller than I thought he would be. Yeah, he's like 6'2 or something. Yeah, he's, but I just didn't recognize him in those yeah. stupid sunglasses. But that He just looked like Euro trash. <laughs> <laughs> and so my, my GM was very angry. But Leo did come back like two days later. And yeah. he was given a table. But um, that, that was my impression of him in person. I wonder if one of those moments, like being treated like everyone else, I wonder if he's like... Oh, he probably oh. jerked off to it. <laughs> <laughs> he probably came in his pants and like walked away. <laughs> he didn't recognize me. Yes. It's this like, is what I crave. Are you, are you <laughs> so hungry? I don't, I don't, I'm not even hungry anymore. Let's just keep doing this yeah. at different spots. Yeah. Uh, that's why he came back. He's like, uh, can I get away with it a second time? 
Oh, uh, have you seen the pictures of the ridiculous masks he wears to like remain anonymous out in public? Mm-hmm. He has a weird one. It kind of looks like a Batman mask. Like no ears, but it's like dark, hard plastic that goes from like his hairline all the way down to like over his upper lip and like sunglass like lenses right here. It's so weird. That guy goes to such ridiculous lengths to remain anonymous out. But you're only drawing more attention to yourself. I know. And like people photograph him. They're like, oh God, there's Leo wearing a weird, stupid face mask something. Wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's been a star since he was a child, so he's probably not as well adjusted. Although you don't hear a ton of weird shit about him. Just the dating younger women. That's really the only negative thing people have to say about him. And the wearing weird masks. <laughs> and the wear... Yeah, but I mean, that's... Hollywood elite, they all make weird fashion choices. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. Cheers. Cheers, dude. Okay, so... You're an actor. Mm-hmm. Do you want to be one of those horror staple actors that always does like a great job and oh this horror movie's coming out and they've got ricky attached so when we know it's going to be good type thing do you want that to be your brand or do you kind of want to do like rom-coms and comic books superhero stuff and like silly like yeah. judd apatow comedies and tv show sitcom law and order whatever this is my thing <clears throat> Actors who become like a horror icon didn't set out to do that. But the smart ones really appreciate the opportunity. Like Robert England, who plays Freddy Mm Krueger, he was a Shakespearean actor and he did a lot of character like acting work in films and stuff all throughout the 70s. And then he books this movie by a little known director named Wes Craven and suddenly he's an overnight star. Mm-hmm. They tried to replace him in the second movie with a stunt man. Uh, playing right. Freddy. And then two weeks, maybe not even two weeks into the filming, they fired the guy and they were like, get Robert England back. He is yeah. like, this is more than just a killer walking around. It's a performance. Right. Yeah. And so he embraced it and you know, it, it, he's appreciative of it. And, um, the new Terrifier films with David Howard Thornton. Mm-hmm. He's a music, he's a song and dance man, you know, yeah. a musical theater guy. But he's he's now one of the biggest horror icons out there right now. So, if the opportunity presented itself, I would gladly do it. You get to do the festival circuit, which see or with like the I'm sorry, the convention circuit, mm-hmm. and go to all the horror cons, and which seems exhausting but also really rewarding because you get to meet the people who really appreciate your work. So, um, as an actor, I'm happy to book any work, you know, that mm-hmm. I can get my hands on. Uh, and I think that it's exciting to be able to play different types of roles, but man, if I were given the chance to, you know, portray an iconic horror character, I would do it in a heartbeat. Yeah. I've never, it's funny. If you look at my acting resume, I'm always evil, scary, bad guy. Um, cause of how I look. Right. But I've never gotten to play like an evil, scary, bad guy in a horror movie before. <laughs> and I would love to, Yeah, like how fun would that be? It'd be a lot of fun. Yeah. Like taking on like a, a Michael Myers or a Freddy Krueger mm-hmm. and having the franchise be successful enough to where you get to come back like every two, three years and do it again. Yep. And hopefully they're always good. Yeah. Or, if you're lucky, half of them are good. Right. Because <laughs> it seems like, I mean, how many Halloweens are there actually? 13. How many Night uh, Nightmare on Elm Streets or Freddy Krueger movies? Because Freddy vs. Jason, I guess, counts as a Freddy movie I'm as gonna well. I'm going to say eight. Okay. That's what I thought. Yeah. Seven. Seven Nightmare on Elm Streets. Eight if you include the remake, but we don't talk about the remake. We don't talk about the remake. <clears throat> oh, it looked good in the trailer. <laughs> I turned it off like 10 minutes in. 10 minutes. That's yeah. all. Yeah. That's I just, fast. I don't need it. No one needed it's this, it. No. Yeah. And I, I'm, you know, I'm Jackie Earl Haley. Jackie Earl Haley. I suppose I, I've heard he does a, a good job. He's very good. Yeah. 
but he's not Robert England. Like there's this. Oh, sorry. You he's know. a good actor. <clears throat> he is a good actor. Yeah, he does fine as Freddy. Well, and it's, it's like very of course different. he's gonna try to make it his own. Yeah, as he should. Yeah, but nobody wants a, a different person playing yeah. Freddy. Yeah, I mean Robert England was larger than life, hmm. which is what you want from someone who haunts you in your dreams. Mm-hmm. Like your dreams aren't supposed to be based in reality. Yeah. And so why would the bad guy that haunts you in your dreams adhere to the rules of reality? Yeah. And I think that was something that Robert England and Wes Craven got right Mm -hmm. that, and I don't know who directed the modern version, but Jackie Earl Haley tried to do a very grounded, like, I don't know. It's a weird thing in my mind right now, but it's all, it's, I don't know if it'll make sense. Robert Robert England's almost didn't believe gravity existed, mm-hmm. and Jackie Earl Haley was grounded yeah. by gravity. I think that's thing. reflective. The series itself, in the first film, Freddy is quite scary. In mm-hmm. the second film, he's quite scary. The third one, and I love Dream Warriors. Like, don't get me wrong, it is my favorite of the series. But it's kind I of remember a, you posted that for Halloween, your countdown. Yeah, 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 yeah. You put them in order. I was like, really? Um, around Dream Warriors and all the subsequent films after he starts to become cartoonish and starts mm-hmm. to become, you know, he was on MTV and he, you know, you could call Freddy Krueger and one yeah. number and like talk to Freddy and, you know, market marketed specifically to children, which is mind blowing right. by today's standards, you know? And, um, so, but he was in the first one rooted in being frightening, but I guess with Jack Earl Harley, it's still even more deeply rooted in like, well, and also, in the original, they imply that he was a child molester. They call him a child killer. But in the yeah. remake, do they actually go through? The only thing I remember from the original is the opening scene, before, like that shows the parents coming to his house and burning him. Okay, in the remake. In the remake. Yeah. And he's like, he's got the, this is burned into my brain. He's got this picture of a kid and he like licks the back slowly mm-hmm. and then sticks it in a book. Like, I don't want that. No, no, no. And it's pictures of kids. Yeah. Um, so I think it's implied that he, at the very least was killing these kids yeah. and keeping a memento book of mm-hmm. sorts. Um, but that's all I really remember. Yeah. I don't think I actually finished it either. It was dream wars for my interview yesterday for this game show. Uh, one of the he was giving me hypotheticals if you were in this movie how would you react what would you do right and in dream warriors because that's the one where it's all the um like kids in the mental hospital who can't sleep and they're all right. having dreams about freddy krueger and then they all realize if they harness their own superpowers in the dream world they can battle him so the question was all right you're in a nightmare on elm street three dream warriors what is your superpower to fight freddy and it's on, on the fly i had to think of something mm-hmm. you know and so i decided all right like transformation because Freddy can transform into different creatures or different, like he's a motorcycle in one of the movies, yeah. you know, it's ridiculous. But what if somebody could also do that and it becomes like a wizard battle, like at the movie of the sword, uh, at the end of the sword and the stone, when yeah. Merlin and Mab keep turning into different bigger animals to try to kill each other. I would watch that. I would watch that. I would watch me fighting Freddy Krueger by trying to outdo him with absolutely what monster or object I turned into. Robert England is still with us, right? He is. Yeah. Yeah. Nightmare 8? He's up there in age. Yeah. Uh, I think he would do it. Last I heard about the rights, um, oh my God, what's his name? Elijah Wood is trying to get his hands on it. He has a production really? company, and he's a massive horror fan. Okay. He was in the remake of Maniac, which I, I think it's better than the original Maniac. And uh, he's trying to get his hands on it. Actually, Kevin Bacon really wants to play Freddy Krueger. Interesting. I know. Yeah, I don't hate that. Um, I don't either. I don't either. I would, because I know what a big horror fan Elijah Wood is, mm-hmm. I would trust him with it. I don't know. Until they hire Danny McBride to write the script. I would hate that. <laughs> Not okay. The um, Friday the 13th franchise has been a big deal lately because... The man who, if I understand it correctly, the man who wrote the screenplay and the man who directed the original film have been at war for like years over who the rights belong to. 
And Interesting. I believe they finally landed in the lap of the man who wrote the original screenplay. If okay. I'm not mistaken, I fuck, I don't remember which studio it's with now, but essentially the rights are now available and or the rights are now landed and they can move forward with the film. They're actually making, uh, I think A24 is producing it, Crystal, I think it's called Crystal Lake and it's a TV series. I've heard of this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the woman who played Alice in the original movie is producing it and is going to be in it. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. cool. Nice. Yeah. Is it going to be like a origin story? I think it's about like young Jason. Jason before he drowns. I think. Okay. Yeah. I don't know full details, but okay. it's, I think it's well, already been filming. I would watch that. I've seen posters. Like I've yeah. seen images. Yeah, because it's it's like the little like boardwalk out into the lake. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just like just that shot. I think I've seen a poster like that. I these remakes and requels. <laughs> requels. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's getting tiring. Mm-hmm. I think Scream did a really good job with it. I actually really like Scream Five and Six, but. This most recent Texas Chainsaw that was on Netflix was a disaster. I didn't see it. I actually I canceled my Netflix and I haven't. I did too, back. out of solidarity with the strike. Same. And I just don't. I don't watch anything on Netflix. Yeah. There was there was a Christmas movie that I love that I wanted to watch back around Christmas. I watched it when I went home. I yeah. used my parents' account. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of. I also. I just. I'm not interested in Netflix at all right now. But I will cycle through subscriptions. Like I'll have like yeah. two in one month and watch everything and then mm-hmm. I'll cancel them. And then the next month I'll have two. That way I'm not paying like forty, fifty dollars. Yep. And every couple months one of them tells me, Oh, we're going up two or three more dollars and it's uh it's more that expensive like than cable. Great was. opportunity to cancel right there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I do the same thing. I right now have Max mm-hmm. and then I use my uh, friends Hulu and um, Max Hulu and Disney Plus. Yeah, because Disney, God love them and hate them. They're doing a good job of keeping me hooked. Yeah, they keep releasing something that I want to yeah. watch. I have my Disney Plus. I keep Hulu for the Golden Girls. Nice. I had just got Apple TV, but that's free through the new phone contract that I signed for the new Samsung yeah. Galaxy. S24 Ultra. Oh my God. Um, yeah, paying all that money and I get a free subscription to Apple TV in exchange. I mean, or Netflix with ads. It's not Netflix without ads, which I'm not signing up for. Because I, once you get used to not having commercials on a streaming you can't service, go back. I can't go back. Can't there, go that back. was a Family Guy joke. Where Lois is like, I, they're they're like he loses his job or something, and she's like, I got used to Hulu with no ads, and I'm not going back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Family Guy hits it on the head every once in a while. Yeah, it. Uh, I haven't watched it in years and years and years, but when it's good, it's good. There's a new show on Peacock. I also had Peacock recently. Just canceled my Peacock. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ted. About uh, Mark Teddy. Wahlberg's young character. Yeah. When he has, so when he's in high school with the teddy bear, Ted. It's very good. Yeah. Um, next time you cycle through Peacock. I'll check it out. Check it out. Yeah, that movie um, was fun. It's uh, Max Bruckholder? Bruckholder? Mm. Some, some, Max is his first name. Uh, the young boy from Parenthood. Okay. Did you ever watch? Mm-mm. That's it. And Seth MacFarlane. <laughs> Those are the two people. Great. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I'll check and it out. And they're great. It's it's them in high school. It's fantastic. All right. It moves like a family guy. The, like the writing is very Seth MacFarlane. Cool. So it moves like a family guy show um, just with live action. I, it's so surprising because that movie came out when? Um, oh, God. And 10, it was, it was fun, but then I feel like everyone forgot about it. Surprising that there's now a TV show. I mean, I'm not mad. I yeah. haven't had the attention span recently for television series. Um, they've been losing me. I've been like, I haven't even been watching a lot of movies. I've been reading a, a fuck ton. Nice. Yeah. What it was kind reading? of a new year's goal of um, start reading again. Yeah. And so what is this? February 3rd, 4th. Fourth, and I, I have read five books so far. Wow. I know. That's impressive. Tell how 
single and lonely and <laughs> reclusive I am. Um, yeah, yeah. But it's been it's been great to like dive back into the world of literature. Yeah. What um, what have you read? What have, what what have you mm-hmm. loved? Uh, so I, God, I read a book called The Sluts by Dennis Cooper, and he's a very controversial, very upsetting, shocking gay writer. And when I bought it at the bookstore, the guy who so he handed me a stack of I, I I was on jury duty. I forgot my book on lunch. I found this mystery bookstore, and I was like, "Hey, do you have any like LGBTQ books?" to recommend and he handed me a stack and I picked this one and as I paid for it, he was like, I just need to warn you about this book and its subject matter. And I was in my leather jacket and I was like, look at me, I'm fine. And I should have heeded his warning because it is the most upsetting, vile, disgusting, evil, perverse, shocking content I have ever encountered in any piece of media. And it is absolutely one of the best books I've ever read in my life, but it, it made me cry at one point and it made me all throw up at another point. It's very upsetting. So I read that. Um, I'm reading a Magica right now by Clive Barker. I read it about a decade ago. Okay. And it's his like epic. It's like 1200 pages long. I have it split into two paperback volumes. Um, but it's, you know, he's such a, he's, he, he writes such rich characters and I love that he, he doesn't write vampires. He doesn't write werewolves. He creates his own, universes and his own monsters and i think that's really cool like he wrote the hellbound heart that hellraiser is based on oh wow yeah yeah so he's terrific very fascinating in this book i read it a decade ago and i'm excited i'm happy to be revisiting it nice yeah what are you reading oh i'm i was gonna go down a hellraiser tangent but oh, we can do that too I mean, did you like the new one i did i did too i did it was a yeah. little long but i appreciated a cup. First off, I just met Doug Bradley at the New York City Horror Film Festival. He played the original Pinhead. Oh, nice. Um, and he was cool. He was really nice. Um, this new one took the themes of what Hellraiser stands for and repurposed them in a new story. Mm-hmm. And I thought that it was really well done. And I thought a lot of people said that the main character was awful and terrible and unlikable. And I was like, okay, but she is an addict and she has to Hellraiser is about penance and accepting punishment and enjoying punishment. Right. Um, The, the limits to which you can experience pain and pleasure. And that is what addiction is, you know? And so the fact that she sees everyone around her suffer is very realistic. And I mm-hmm. thought that was really cool. Also, Jamie, oh my God, the actress who played Pinhead, um, Jamie, anyway, I thought was a terrific choice. Yes. Yeah, I thought Really she was fucking great. good. Spooky and got it. And um, as a trans woman, used that essence of her to a great advantage in this role. And uh, I just, I thought it was good. Yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was very good. Um, there's something about movies like that where it kind of really gets me, kind of like puts me in a situation of like, like I could, I could do a nightmare on Elm Street and I could be like, okay, I understand the rules of this. I could figure this out. Mm-hmm. Freddie has limits. Freddie has rules. There's a way to beat them. Yeah. But in this Hellraiser, like the guy that just gets pricked in the park who did nothing wrong and now he's yeah. in hell essentially that stuff really just like makes my skin crawl. Cause I'm yeah. like, I, what if I got scratched by a thing? Right. <laughs> and then I, I go to hell for eternity. Yeah. And then they like, they, they win at the end mm-hmm. and then their friends are just in hell and they're yeah. like, we're going to have to figure out how to move forward from here. I'm like, go get your friends. Yeah. Yeah. Figure out a way to go save your friends' eternal souls yeah. that are currently being pulled apart and put back together. Damn, it's really, just it's just it's it it's one of those things that it's just like a little extra something that gets me. Yeah. Gets me crawling. Yeah, it's upsetting. I, I do like that the the universe is not fully explained. Hellraiser 2 
goes into the hell universe and you see it. <clears throat> and I think that it does a good job of showing you where the Cenobites are coming from, but not giving anything away. Mm -hmm. And the idea of Leviathan, kind of this evil God figure um, is introduced there. And this new remake utilized that Leviathan figure really well. And I thought really also did a great job with the lament configuration, the puzzle box and mm -hmm. how it had different shapes and what they meant. And it really explored that in a cool way. It just brought some new stuff to it that, um, that I hadn't seen before. That series is notorious for Hollywood would be passing around a horror screenplay and then it would just land in the Hellraiser lap and they would rewrite it to make it a Hellraiser movie. So really? after part three, none of them were supposed to be har uh, Hellraiser films. Part three, they remade, they were ripping off Nightmare on Elm Street and Pinhead becomes almost like a Freddy. And then four and beyond, none of them were supposed to be Hellraiser movies. They just happened to land in the laps of producers and they were like, hey, let's put the Cenobites in this. And that's what that's wild. Yeah. They get so, worse and worse. And some of them are like actually insufferably bad and some yeah. of them are fun bad. So this new one, this Hulu original one, mm -hmm. that's the first one in a long time that was intended, intended from, from the yeah. start. Clive Barker like helped and was yeah. involved. and Very cool. Yeah, I, I just wasn't what people expected it to be, and I appreciate that. Yeah, no, it's that's not, how it's you not re, what I that's how you remake or requel a horror film. Evil Dead Rise was fucking great. Did you see it? So that's the most recent one, right? Yeah. Where they're stuck in the apartment building after yeah. the earthquake. Yeah, I did. That's see what you need to do with Evil yeah. Dead, just like the Adventures of the Necronomicon and the fucking idiots yeah. who open it, right? Yeah, Where it's it's. We had the TV show Ash versus the Evil Dead, and Bruce Campbell was incredible on it, but that story it got canceled. Yeah. And it's like he's kind of reached an age where coming back as Ash is not as, you know, uh, it, it's just not as it's not happening. You know, yeah, if, he, if he keeps winning, then it's yeah. it's more plot armory yeah. at this point. Um, I loved Evil Dead Rise and that's not even my franchise. Like I'm not obsessed yeah. with it, but I, I had a really good time with that one. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I, I thought the actress that played the mom did a great job. Oh, so good. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's. Like when I picture Evil Dead, her face, like her structure with the like the wide eyes, yeah. and I don't, I don't know if it's the red hair just feels very correct, yeah. But something about like the red hair on the very pale skin mm -hmm. with the bright orange. Well, of the they eyes. did a good job with introducing that red hair because she's dyeing her hair that night, right? So of course it's going to be freshly too bright, mm -hmm. you know. But then it works when she becomes a deadite because it's just cartoonishly red yeah you know it was just it was very fun yeah and gross. that's yeah that's that's another one though part of what i liked about it part of what bothered me is just doing laundry i think yeah. in the elevator yeah and then all of a sudden just possessed yeah. that's why I, I avoid doing laundry <laughs> that's not that's why why i avoid the weird magic boxes that yeah. want to draw blood or weird books made out of skin as a rule, I think I'm not going to read a book if it's made of skin. It's a good way to live your life. Yeah. <laughs> um, you did ask what I'm reading. Yeah. Uh, there's a series by V.E. Schwab called Darker Shade of Magic. Okay. And she just came out with the fourth. Uh, so it's the start of a new trilogy called Fragile Threads of Power. Mm -hmm. And it's very good. It's... Um, kind of based on this idea of parallel worlds and there are these beings that are um do you ever watch avatar last airbender i didn't you understand the I'm concept not a fucking nerd i'm just kidding go on people so love there's, it it's a big deal it's, it's i love it so there's uh there's elements that people can manipulate with magic in this and there are beings that are more powerful that can manipulate every element, but it's not just like Avatar where there's one, there's several, and they can travel between the worlds, between the uh, different, they're all in London, and so it's like red London, white London, gray London, and then black London mm -hmm. is like shut off and blocked, and like all the doors are closed because magic is alive, and it has a will and if it's abused it'll rebel type thing and that's what happened in black london cool and it consumed the world 
And so that's kind of the setting. And the whole story takes place with this black magic trying to take over all the other Londons. It's very interesting. Wow. So think like um, steampunk, London, magic. I would read the hell out of this. Yeah. That sounds cool. Yeah, it's right, very you'll good. you have to send me the name of it. Absolutely. Yeah. We are at like an hour and a half. Okay. Is there anything you want to plug before you get out of here? Uh, Did your podcast? Sure. You your yeah. Musical. Absolutely. Check out my podcast, Rick Retreat Horrorcast. Uh, you can check out my website, rickretreat.com. And I am on <clears throat> all social media platforms at Rick Retreat Pod and my YouTube as well. Check it out and stay in touch. Hit me up and read my writing on roomorg.com and spoilerfreereviews.com. How do you spell roomorg? R U E. M O R G U E. It's in reference to the Ed Allan Poe story. Great. Murders in the Room Morgue. Um, yeah. The podcast, you can listen to it on all platforms. All platforms Spotify, mm -hmm. Audible, Apple, all of them. All of the above. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate you taking the time. I had so much fun. I never Thank get you. to be the one like, interviewed on a podcast yeah so it was, was great you were really you were really good at it thank you yeah, i man. appreciate that i love your show thank you cheers cheers yeah <laughs>